Hello and welcome to my little corner of the Kings County Fiber Festival. I'm thrilled to be visiting with you in my Brooklyn backyard. You may hear some free range <laughs> sounds of the streets or the neighbors or see a, a cat in passing. Um, and we're going to just keep going when that happens. Um, my name is Sarah Stopek and I fell in love with texture a very, very long time ago in knitting. I started out loving color as much as the next guy, but long, long ago in a yarn store very far away, I walked in to get some yarn for a very simple project, and I walked out with this book, Barbara Walker's Treasury of Knitting Patterns, her first of several, and it completely changed my life, um, and I it, it became just fascinated with the thousands of ways that stitches can combine the textures they can create, the categories they make, even wondering who were those first people who twisted a stitch or slipped a stitch, and I'm thinking that happened by accident and they made the best out of what, what you and I might have called a mistake. So I feel really honored and connected to almost everyone who's ever knit through history and to Barbara herself, my, my one of my big knitting heroes. Um, I have by no means tasted all of these, nor have I tasted all of her second book, and there are more after that. Um, so I'm going to taste to you some delicious texture stitch snacks, and uh, they'll all be from these two books. And um, I want to uh, uh, start right now with my taste analogies. If this were a cookbook, uh, it would be completely at least this dog-eared and full of tiny little pieces of paper where I put in notes of things I wanted to try someday. Um, and if it were a cookbook, it would also be splashed with you know, maybe wine stains or tomato sauce or some other experiment. Um, our experiments won't be quite so messy, um, and I hope you'll find them delightful. So. Uh, since we can't be together for the feasting or the knitting, um, uh, you know how we talk about the yarn, a yarn tasting, where you kind of sample the yarn and play with the yarn and maybe you smell the yarn and think about what does this yarn want to be? Um, I think of the textures and the stitch patterns as what does this texture or structure want to do? So I'm gonna welcome you to this delicious appetizer platter and we're gonna give each one their very own cameo. Um, so let us hold that thought and I'll be back with you shortly uh, for their individual performances. Okay, our first stitch snack is ready for her close-up. This is Italian chain ribbing and it's a hybrid of a ribbing, basic ribbing, and lace. So you can see if I stretch it a little, these little columns are a lacy mix of the basic DNA of lace, which is yarn overs, SSKs, and knit two togethers. And in between are these two pearl bumps. And as you see on the rear, those appear as knit bumps. It kind of looks good on both sides, so would be a not bad scarf or a cowl or baby blanket. Everything makes a good something like that. Um, it draws in like a ribbing, but not as densely as some. And while I have that there, for contrast, I'm going to bring in a cable swatch I made up. First to point out that um, each of these swatches is done on about the same number of stitches. It's on a 24 base and in some cases I had to add a stitch or two on one side or the other to make the stitch counts of the repeat work out. Um, but as you can see, this is way squishier in your than the Italian cable. Um, and it's also quite fat in this direction, right? So it would make it incredibly, it's what cables do, dense and warm fabric that would be, I, I'm sort of figuring that could be a puffer vest. Of course, it could be a turtleneck or a, of a sweater or a cowl. Um, and speaking of contrast for the, <laughs> for the width, here we have a twist stitch pattern. This is Little Wave, and it's a very simple uh, mix of a stockinetti column and a column of a pair of twisting stitches that go like this, back and forth, across a little gravel bed of garter stitch. It's extremely cute. Um, and of course, you could vary this by changing the spaces in between or the width, um, uh, uh, but it's kind of a nice effect, these little snakes. And I want to point out, because of its very strong stockinetti genetic components, it curls up quite a lot as stockinette does. So it's not as balanced knit to pearl wise as some of the others we have looked at and will look at. Um, 
on the other side, completely different proportions, right, is this very cool slip stitch pattern, the name of which I have lost, and it's made very simply. I've been eyeing this one for years. Um, you basically, on the path out, you go, after a couple rows of gutter, you go knit, wrap, 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 knit, wrap, 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 and on the return row, you drop all the extra wraps and then switch these four over four stitches. So it's like a little weaving trick in the middle. It gives you this nice openness. Um, and I was pretty enamored of it. It lies completely flat as a very much of a garter basic genetics, uh, but it didn't play well with others when we got to the Lego game. And you'll see what I mean when we do get there. Again, about the same number of stitches behaves really differently. This is waving rib pattern, and it's kind of a miracle of a mix of pearls and knits. So just by moving these little pearl twos, it's knit for, knit for pearl two, and then it's, you shift that over, these little pearl two blobbies pull in like a ribbing, although not nearly as inny as a ribby rib, um, and then they move this little single column, or these two columns, of, of uh, stockinette stitch in this amazing wavy pattern, just with knits and pearls. It's pretty cool. Um, to make it even more exciting, it's a twofer. On the rear, on the reverse, it has a beautiful, uh, super simple little basket weave pattern. Um, I couldn't be more excited about this. And because of its mix-ish pearl knit componentry, uh, it lies pretty flat. It also kind of stands up well as a rib would, so it's got a lot of ribbiness to it. I just noticed that in addition to the cats and sirens we're enjoying here, we also have the occasional falling leaf and dirt. <laughs> and welcome to the garden. Um, similar but different and completely differently worked to either the cable or the other knit pearl combos. This is a slip stitch pattern. And in this one, you elongate these stitches by slipping them over several rows and then cross them over this cute little lozenge of garter stitch. This is called jewel rib cross. Um, super fun to work and super quick. In fact, this was in the book as a seven stitch pattern and I switched it to a six stitch pattern just by changing the number of stitches between here. And I did that so that it would match up nicely with my, one of my other patterns and it does with the waving ribbon. We'll see that in the actual project. Um, you're thinking you could have added. Yes, you could. Um, all of these stitches came from people experimenting. I like to think they were sitting around enjoying each other's company and knitting as we hope one day to do again soon. And finally, another twist stitch pattern. This is called wicker work and it has a wicker worky vibe, right? It's like a little caned chair of a pattern. Uh, in this case, these twisted stitches cross a little field of garter and then a little go the other way with a little punch of um, stockinette stitch. It kind of vibes nicely. Okay, so let's talk about how this wicker work stitch plays nicely with others. Uh, for one example, it has a similar but different kind of flow to the jewel cross rib. So this is a twist stitch thing, this is a slip stitch thing, but they both have a draw in, a pattern, and draw out. So when I get to the part of like really getting my Lego nailed down onto the board, I need to know where I want these Chrissy Crossies to line up with those twisty wisties, right? But um, I feel good about it, and um, I did it relatively on the fly. You'll see it in the project, and it is written out. Uh, but uh, I did have to take a couple runs at it. Um, and what I actually started with, of course, and you know I did because I sold this pattern pretty hard in the beginning, was this waving rib. Actually wouldn't be bad with the wicker work directly, but I, it, because it feels ribby, I thought I'm going to start with this as a cowl. So I did waving rib after much legoing, right, and play. Um, I thought, look at that, huh? I said to myself, and um, these three were my winners for the taste testing. So we're going to now put all the swatches and yarn together in a magic thing, and we'll show you that after I hope you get yourself a cup of tea. See you in a bit. Okay. So we are now going to take our 
delicious ingredients and uh, combine as we discussed, which means these fabulous ideas and this very beautiful yarn are going to go into the knitting time machine, easy bake oven of magic, and we'll get started. Um, this is a Barocco Mercado yarn that is new to me, and uh, I'm going to do it on size nine needles. Okay. Presto! Time passed, knitting happened. It's amazing. Before I go too much further with this, I want to point out this is garter stitch and this is stockinette stitch. Those count. So when you're mixing things together, don't forget these guys. Um, back to you, my lovey cowl. Oh, I wanted something wubby. I cast on 96 stitches and yes, I did swatch. And one reason I chose a cowl, um, and we'll talk more about this in the tips and thank you section. Um, and tools, tools, and tips, and thanks. Uh, um, I chose a cowl because it's one thing, and so you're done when you're done. But I also like working in the round because I can see and learn the stitch pattern, just the way my particular version of visual learning works, faster, um, and kind of check myself as I go. So I did a whole bunch of that, and I want to show you how I specifically blended in the from the waving rib with its own little duckinette straight up lines of knit stitches down into the twisting that goes through the jewel cross rib. And I had to take a couple runs at it despite my attempts at during the Lego portion of my play. Um, uh, so that was took, a, I think it was the second or third time of that. I kind of like that. And it's hard to really see this, but you really feel it when you put the cowl on in a trial mode. Um, actually the, because this is a stockinettier thing, the jewel cross rib compared to the waving rib which has rib in the name and it does draw in I'm getting kind of a free increase so when I kind of get to here and I have my very wubby yum cowl that I can also roll down so you see the inside basket weave bonus stitch um, depending how cold it is um, I'm getting that kind of over the, the little part here where I, I get wider and if you're thinking like I'm thinking you might be saying like well, why a cowl, Sarah? Why not keep going? This could indeed be the start of a circular yoke sweater. Or if I had a very tiny waist, this could be a, about to become a twirly skirt. I think that would be a great project. Um, but we're gonna make a cowl. And just FYI, this is still the first skein and I have plenty to go for when I decide to add in my delicious wicker work stitch. And give me one moment, because let me show you how I'm working that out. I'm doing it with my handy dandy scratch pad. This is a how I doodle, and I learned this from Maxine, um, and it's genius. So what I have done here is work the whew, the jewel cross rib a whole bunch, and then I worked some sneaky increases because the jewel cross rib, like the uh, waving rib, is on a six stitch pattern repeat, six stitch repeat, and the wicker work is on an eight. Um, so I could have just switched since I'm knitting on a six, 72 stitch, this is my cowl base. Um, both of those d numbers divide into 72, but then they wouldn't line up. So one thing I could have done instead of what I did do is run a roll of purl stitches or maybe several, like a little kind of reverse stockinette welt just for a visual break. And that would also give you a chance if you were moving from a really hard to divide thing, like for if you're going from a six stitch or an eight stitch repeat to a 17 stitch repeat or an 11, or even something a little more normal sounding, but that doesn't divide. You could sneak your increases in there and you've done the visual break so you won't be so much worried about lining up. Um, you could also do decreases if you're going in the other direction, as I'm sure you've already, already realized, but I didn't want that. Um, so I'm getting an even bigger thing here past my little freebie increase I got just by changing stitch pattern, which is the kind of thing you'd get right if you did two by two rib regular. You'd suddenly have the kind of a bonus, a free increase without increasing the number of stitches, if that makes sense to you. Um, what I did here is I sneaked in my increases, two for each six stitch repeat to get me to the eight stitches. And I kind of like the way that is flowing in together, and I hope you like it too. So for our next, I kind of want to knit this right now. Uh, so for our next chat, I'm going to encourage and hopefully give you the tools you need 
to do any experimenting that you haven't thought of yet, but feel emboldened to do. Um, I feel as though every amazing thing that's happened to me in knitting has been not necessarily emboldening me, but pointing out to me that I'm bolder than I thought. And I mean, the woman in the <laughs> long ago far away yarn store who introduced me to Barbara Walker, Barbara Walker herself, Maxine, the, the co-founder and uh, empresario of the Kings County Fiber Festival, and many, many other knitters in circles everywhere. And I cannot wait, as I said, for us to be able to feast and knit together again. But um, coming up soon, the tips, the thanks, and the tools. And now I would like to give some thanks and some acknowledgement and some credit where it is due. But first, my apologies. I said confusingly that I cast on 96 stitches for this cowl. I crochet cast on 72 stitches. What actually happens here is I increase, as I was describing, from the six times, six stitch times 12 repeats, 72, to eight times 12 is 96. So it's becoming the 96. And just for your reference, um, this is about 18 inches, which is a smaller squeeze in than the ball band indicates, and that is because of the ruby nature of the rib. So sorry about that. It'll be, of course, right in the pattern, and of course you can check my knitting anytime just by coming right on over here. Um, I want to thank kind of all the knitting ancestors, and to me that is everyone that ever drew, drew a loop through a loop with a crochet hook or the ancestor to both uh, knitting and crochet, or the sailors who thought I could make this knot more quickly, more fast, meaning more hold fast, and more beautiful. Um, to anyone who has ever patched worked anything and then realized how much more beyond that could be than uh, how much more the whole is than the sum of its parts. Um, I would like to thank my mom and uh, I don't really remember her teaching me to knit, but I remember her assuring me she would no longer cast on, curl, or bind off for me, and I was going to have to figure it out, which was excellent advice. I'd like to thank anyone out there in the midst of time who ever turned a slip stitch or an uh, inadvertent yarn over or two switches, stitches that got switched out of order into a feature instead of a bug. That was inspired and inspiring. I thank Barbara Walter. Uh, I just think she's a miracle of cleverness, and I know that she, too, is drawing on the stitch sharing and imagining of many, many knitters who were alongside and before. Um, I'd like to thank several anonymous uh, fellow subway riders in New York City when I first moved here who leaned over and uh, taught me how to knit Continental, which was super awesome, and I had to figure out how to pearl Continental all by myself, which uh, inadvertently led me to being a sort of hybridized Eastern knitter for a little while until I got it all straightened out and at least knew what that meant. Um, I would very much like to thank every craft companion in my whole life, near and far, and that's a, an amazing circle of people. And I'm just going to single out Elizabeth Robinson, who helped me so much by stage managing and kind of coaching me as we put this together. Um, that's a free range siren, and we're good. We live in the city. We're going to keep knitting. I also would like to thank uh, my beloved Robert Moscow, tech support for life, and artistic director who really. Uh, made this happen for me, and I'm just thrilled. And uh, Maxine, thank you. You uh, didn't maybe make me a bold knitter, but you pointed it out to me, and I'm thrilled. I also want to shout out to Lisa Dachinger, whose wool this is, and to Tishan of Redbridge Studio, whose t-shirt this is. These are both Kings County Fiber Festival many year friends. I can't wait to be with everyone in person again. Um, and now, we talked about those appetizers. Remember the appetizers? Yum! And I want to sort of say that the cowl, I would consider like a, like a hearty soup. But if you're looking for a main course, you can take all of these same ideas that I'm messing around with here, and you can do, I think this is kind of a main course sweater. So the thing I described where the cables go squishy in, and then the, just switching to stuck and that kind of uh, opens up the fabric, and then I also added some increase between the cables, which themselves increase. Go forth, and um, I, I, and of course, Thanksgiving dinner for twelve. If you wanted to do that, uh, a classic Gansey sweater would be a great and a great uh, version of that. So were uh, I don't know if anyone saw the Jean Paul Gaultier exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum some years back, but there was some amazing ball gown like knit crochet magic together. Um, I say go for that. And now I want to share some sort of tips 
and I don't want to miss any, so pardon my paper, and resources. Uh, for some reason, at the head of the section, I have a note about how this is going to enable you to have your cake and eat it too, an expression that has been much discussed in my household in recent days, and I have no idea what I mean by that, but doesn't it sound delicious? So, um, here are some things that I like to use. I like, pardon me, I like these 3x5 and 4x6 graph card index cards, graph paper index cards. They fit nicely in a project bag, in a little pocket. Uh, that's, you don't have to have a whole pad with you, you can always have a couple of them around. If you don't have a stitch pattern to chart out and figure out how you're going to do this the way we did with our stitch patterns where we tried to Lego like that, um, uh, you can still use them for a shopping list. So I just greatly recommend. They also have, oh wait, not to I'm a big fan of the stitch marker. I don't use them as often as maybe I should. If you use stitch markers, please do so. Between every pattern repeat, if that's what works for you, that slows me down and I don't like that, as you can guess. Um, I, they're also useful, and you can see this on the sweater I just waved at you. They're also useful for, uh, for this is for example, I'm, I'm noting where uh, the decrease, uh, the increases are happening and the decreases on the side. So useful for marking rows as well as between stitches. All right, handy dandy list. Uh, the scratch pad that we shared before, the, the little thing of yarn that you're always able to doodle with. So if you're like, wait a minute, and you want to figure out anything at all, see that's where it switches from 72 to 96 uh, in, in mini form. Uh, it means you don't have to interrupt your project. You can have a little, you know, like a back of an envelope ever to hand. Um, I want to talk about uh, converting to in the round. Um, it's, you only have to do it once. And uh, that swatch is like your map. So this is like a decoder ring that you use as you kind of are moving this from looking at the back side as you purl back to looking at the front side all the time. So here's the easiest kind of instruction for a stitch that you could possibly have for that. If, every, if it says purl every stitch on the wrong side rows, you instead knit every stitch on the wrong side rows and you have no math or calculation or magic to figure out. And the second easiest is purl the pearls and knit the knits or play them as they lay. Uh, so those are great for starters. On the other hand, should you want to, if you're working in the round on say a simple cable or a complicated cable, you actually could do your cable crosses on an odd number of rows rather than an even number. Like we typically cross every fourth or sixth or whatever row, partly because we like to see what we're doing when we're doing the crosses. You can absolutely uh, knit back and forth when you're knitting flat and cross on the purl side row. It's just more prone to error because you're not actually seeing the end result. Um, I also want to say, good idea to mess with odd ca uh, cast on and bind off options on swatches so you know how it behaves for you. Uh, if you say it's really stretchy and it's not really stretchy when you do it, good to know. Um, the On choosing how you would play with a stitch pattern, I think you start with love and curiosity. So any pattern you have now that has a stitch, a, a, a guide to the stitch in it, that stitch pattern can be put in anything else. I know you know that. Um, also, if you ever see an interesting finished object in the wild, I uh, have spent uh, many a happy hour of uh, sitting behind a friend and I think it was a, a religious service and he was wearing a sweater featuring what I now know to be entrelac and I could not figure out how that was done. So there's plenty to be explored just by looking around on, on the subway for example. Um, many great knitting books as you know include a little menu of stitches in the back that are to be messed with by you and there's all kinds of new magic now like sequence knitting and stack decreases with really very novel textures which you can incorporate into any kind of project that you want and not just I know you do your own exploration, but come along with me. Here's another point. A hat is like a cowl, but then you do the decreases toward the top. And a headband is like a cowl that's even just a mini cowl. So one thing about all of those types of patterns is they're, they're pretty forgiving in gauge. So it's one of the reasons I thought it was good to experiment with a cowl for this adventure, because if it was 18 and a half, versus 19 versus 18, I still have a beautiful cowl. And if I'm knitting a ball gown, 
or a pair of socks, I'm pretty much a lot fussier than that about the fit. Um, another project I love to just take a great stitch pattern that I newly fell in love with is um, a mitt or mitten, which is find your stitch count in your swatching and then do that pattern, that stitch pattern around and around and around and then add whatever your favorite thumb is. Um, for some reason, that's a very satisfying project. Um, a scarf is great. I always forget to mention scarves. Uh, if, if you are working flat and you want to see both sides, um, or at least the reverse is attractive, you can think of a scarf as a small baby blanket, and a baby blanket is a gigantic scarf, right? Um, uh, and a bib is a little bitty one, so you, if you have a nice enough yarn that you want to just feature a swatch for somebody for a baby present, you could do that in a very short amount of time and really learn that stitch pattern cold. Um, but if you are like me and people tend to bring you yarn uh, and you don't know why, and if it's washable, say it's super wash or has a fair amount of acrylic, you can also make a Swiffer cover. And a Swiffer cover is a really nice amount of stitching to get the feel of a pattern you may not have played with before, or a texture that you're not sure will work for a, a real thing. Furthermore, a Swiffer cover made out of washable yarn goes right in the laundry with your socks, and I don't know if you have cats, but I can assure you, it's amazing at picking up uh, cat hair and dust and such things. I also, of course, want to mention the, again, the mystery uh, knit-along blanket, which is 16 stitch patterns. So you could decide you fell in love with four of these and not do the other 12, but it is another great uh, thing that gets you somewhere worth getting to a beautiful finished object while having a lot of textural play. And just because I haven't mentioned her in a while, and I still love her, um, these books are still available, uh, and I think there will be many more people exploring the new versions of stitches people are coming up with, like the sequencing of the stashing pieces, and maybe you can make up some hybrid of your own from what she has to teach us and what you've learned from other ancestors. And thank you for coming to my knitting tasting. <laughs>